Chuck Fresh, today we're going to talk about the top 10 potential poisons in everyday life and how you can avoid them, be a little healthier, a little safer. Look, I don't mean to scare you. Maybe some of you need to be a little scared, but in our wonderfully convenient modern world, we've kind of jacked up nature a little bit and created these potential dangers you may or may not be aware of. So here are the top 10 potential poisons you'll probably encounter every day and how to avoid most of them and keep yourself healthy and happy. Number one, aluminum in antiperspirant could cause Alzheimer's. Now, a lot of people use deodorant or antiperspirant or a combination of the two every day. So these products are both effective ways to manage sweating, but they work a little bit differently. Deodorant, on one hand, deodorizes or makes sweat smell a little better or sweeter. Antiperspirants, on the other hand, use aluminum to help you sweat less. Now, how does that work? Well, aluminum that's found in the antiperspirants not in deodorants, unless they're combined. A lot of them are combined as a deodorant and antiperspirant. But the aluminum salts dissolve on your skin and melt into your pores. This helps plug up those pores temporarily until you wash it out or it goes away and stops some of your sweat. Now, some proponents of aluminum-free products claim that aluminum prevents you from sweating out toxins that could potentially cause cancer. But toxins typically aren't removed from the body through your underarm lymph nodes. The kidneys and liver help remove these toxins from your body, and then they're expelled later on through your urine and feces eventually. Now, a 2018 study suggests that too much aluminum may change how the body makes a response to the female hormone estrogen. Changes in the endocrine or your hormone management system can be harmful to your body over time because we really don't know what they're doing, and your body's not able to function normally. Other research shows that your skin, which is an organ, absorbs very little of the aluminum applied to it via products like antiperspirant. Now, this is interesting because the FDA requires manufacturers of antiperspirant products to add a warning to their label that states, ask a doctor before you use this if you have kidney disease. Now, this has led some people to believe that the aluminum in these products may also increase the risk of kidney disease. But aluminum and antiperspirant probably poses no kidney-related risk to the average person without kidney disease. So that's a good thing. According to a 2016 study, chronic exposure to aluminum may increase your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Now, a 2018 review found that adults with Alzheimer's disease had higher levels of metals like aluminum, mercury, and cadmium in their blood. But these metals were thought to maybe be absorbed from multiple environmental sources and not just antiperspirant. So we're not sure the jury's still out. Number two, fluoride in your water might make you dumb. Fluoride components are found naturally in a lot of water systems, in plants, rocks, air, and even soil. Now, water fluoridation is the process of adding fluoride to water. Why do we do this? Well, the fluoride concentrations in the public water supply are there and they're regulated. And it's really done to improve the health of your teeth. Now, cavities, dental cavities, were a serious health problem in the United States in the early 20th century. A cavity in back in those days was treated by just yanking the whole tooth out. Painful, nasty, and you end up with a bunch of ugly teeth. So in the 1930s and 40s, researchers realized that children who lived in areas with higher levels of naturally occurring fluoride in the water had fewer cavities than those who lived in areas with lower levels of fluoride. Hey, ding! So scientists later learned that the optimal level of fluoride in the water to prevent tooth decay and to avoid a cosmetic condition known as dental fluorosis, where young teeth turn brown and become weak with a little too much fluoride, was about 0.7 parts per million. Dental fluorosis only occurs during the formation of teeth in childhood, but the most critical time is under age two. So once community water fluoridation spread throughout the whole country back in the day, the average number of decayed, missing, or filled teeth in children declined somewhere in the neighborhood of 68 to 70 percent. So the debate about water fluoridation that you probably heard about stems from a 1991 U.S. National Toxicology Program study that found that rats, male rats, uh, given water with a high fluoride content for two years had an increased risk for a type of cancerous bone tumor called osteosarcoma. Now, a 2006 study published by scientists at Harvard University found that boys exposed to fluoridated water had an elevated risk of developing osteosarcoma during their teenage years when they're developing, when their bones are growing. 
There are some concerns about how fluoride affects the developing human brain. A 2019 review found that excessive fluoride exposures in children were linked to cognitive defects or deficits. So another review of studies that included data on over 7,000 children had similar findings, knowing that higher fluoride exposure from water was associated with lower intelligence. These two reviews, however, were both from areas where the fluoride level is naturally high and not added to the water system. A smaller study on Canadian mothers and their infants found that formula-fed babies made with intentionally fluoridated tap water had lower performance IQ than breastfed babies in the same study. So there's that. Fluoride exposure in infants and children does warrant further exploration, especially in areas where the fluoridated water levels are naturally high. Jury's still out, but me, I'm going to stay away from the fluoride as much as I can. We filter water here. Number three, lead poisoning in a lot of older homes and buildings is toxic. Lead is a highly toxic metal and very strong poison. Lead poisoning is serious and sometimes fatal. It occurs when Lead builds up in the body and your bloodstream doesn't know what to do with it. Lead, you can find in lead-based paints on the walls of old houses and old toys that might be laying around somewhere. Lead poisoning usually occurs over a period of months or years. It can cause severe mental and physical impairment. The young children are the most vulnerable because they put things in their mouth commonly. Environmental Defense Fund also reports that several common foods, foods contain detectable levels of lead. This includes some fruit juices, root vegetables, such as sweet potatoes, carrots, and certain cookies and candies that come from some places in Mexico, believe it or not. Now, homegrown vegetables can also become a hazard if you grow them in soil with high amounts of lead. So you think you're doing good by growing your own, and boom, you're still getting lead poisoning. It can be treated, but any damage caused by lead poisoning cannot be reversed, unfortunately. The symptoms of lead poisoning are varied. They may affect many parts of your body. And over time, it builds up slowly, as we said before. It, it follows repeated exposures to small quantities of lead, lead poisoning. The toxicity is rare after a single exposure or ingestion of lead. It's just over time. So signs of repeated lead exposure include abdominal pain, irritability and aggressive behavior, sleep problems, headaches out of nowhere, loss of developmental skills in children, and memory loss lower IQ, fatigue, anemia, those two are usually together, and the potential of kidney dysfunction. So one of the biggest sources of lead for families is, again, the lead-based paint in homes and apartment buildings built before 1978. This material may be buried under layers of newer non-lead paint, but it's still there. Now, lead dust can form through friction on the paint, along, like on windowsills, door frames, stairs, railings. Children or adults can ingest that lead dust when they put their hands on toys or uh, on plates, utensils, food, or other objects in their mouth that are in contact with this dust. So you might be exposed to lead if you work in recycling, construction companies, foundries, uh, manufacturing, uh, companies that make bullets, jewelry, or electronics. And some hobbies also use lead-based product, including bullets and BB ammo, fishing sinkers, pottery, stained glass, jewelry, certain paints, and uh, even car or boat repair supplies. Lead crystal or lead glazed pottery or porcelain, including old porcelain bathtubs, can also be a hazard when that glaze starts to deteriorate. Now, lead occurs naturally in some soils, sometimes at really high concentrations. So to avoid tracking that lead or lead dust in your house, it's better to leave your shoes at the door and wash your hands uh, especially after you come inside and any tools that you've taken outside. Now, some local water systems contain lead, as you may have heard in the news, but lead in your drinking water is more likely to leach into your home water from lead-contaminated pipes and faucets and solder used in homes built before 1986. So to reduce that lead exposure, uh, they recommend that you flush the tap for at least one minute before using water for drinking or cooking. They also recommend that you use cold water for cooking, drinking, and making baby formula because the hot water circulating through the pipes uh, from your hot water heater all the way through the pipes to your faucet will dissolve lead from the pipes more readily than cold water. If you use a water filter, make sure it's certified for lead removal by NSF International and change that filter as recommended by the manufacturer. Volatile organic compounds, or VOCs, are invisible poison in your homes there. Now, volatile organic 
compounds are chemicals that are used and produced in the manufacture of paints, pharmaceuticals, and refrigerants. They're typically industrial solvents or byproducts produced by chlorination and water treatments, such as chloroform. VOCs are common groundwater contaminants, so you really can't avoid them. Well, you can't avoid them altogether, but you can try to protect yourself. Now, they're emitted as gases from certain solids or liquids. They're often components of petroleum fuels, hydraulic fluids, uh, paint thinners, and dry cleaning agents. So VOCs are emitted by thousands of household products, including paints and lacquers, uh, cleaning supplies, pesticides, building materials, uh, furnishings, office equipment, such as uh, uh, copiers and printers, and craft materials, including glues and adhesives and even permanent markers. Now, concentrations of many VOCs are up to 10 times higher indoors. Why? Because the air is not moving as much indoors. All of these products can release organic compounds while you're using them, and to some degree, even when they are stored and closed up. Now, the risk of health effects from inhaling any chemical depends on how much is in the air and how long and how often a person breathes it in. Common short-term exposure to these high levels of VOCs may include eye, nose, and throat irritation. So it's, it's in the air, it's bothering you, you know it's there, you can smell it. Headaches, nausea and vomiting, dizziness. If you have asthma, it'll worsen your symptoms, you have a hard time breathing. Chronic exposures over long term could include cancer, liver and kidney damage, and central nervous system damage. So they recommend only buy what you need when it comes to paint, solvents, adhesives, and caulks. The unused chemicals stored in your home can sometimes leak and release VOCs into the air. Properly dispose of unused chemicals that are stored in your home. You don't want them sitting around, and of course they deteriorate over time and they may not even be effective. Store unused chemicals in a garage or shed where you don't really spend much time. And when buying new items, even furniture and things, or flooring, look for items that have had an opportunity to off gas in the store. So they've had a chance to expunge the majority of their VOC fumes somewhere else, hopefully in a warehouse where no one's breathing them. Consider purchasing low VOC options of paints and furnishing. Now, solid wood items with low emitting finishes will contain less VOCs than items made with composite wood. And the composite wood is usually cheaper and more attractive to buy, so just be aware of that. Increasing the amount of fresh air in your home with windows or doors, open doors, will help reduce the concentration of VOCs indoors. And be aware that chemicals off-gas more in high temperatures and humidity. It's just a simple chemical reaction. And if you're doing home renovations, try to do those when the house is unoccupied or during seasons, cooler seasons, that will allow you to open doors and windows to increase ventilation. All right, we're getting to some words I have a hard time pronouncing. Trihalomethanes, or THM as we'll call them, can jack up your nervous system. They're the result of, the THMs are a result of a reaction between the chlorine used for disinfecting tap water and the natural organic matter found in the water. So one of the most common byproducts is chloroform. You know, that stuff they put on a napkin and <sighs> knock people out with in the movies. Yeah, I don't know if that's really a thing, if you could really do that. I don't think it is, but I'm not trying it. At elevated levels, THMs have been associated with negative health effects such as cancer and adverse reproductive outcomes, which are never good. Now, a study by government and academic researchers adds to that previous evidence that absorption through your skin or even the inhalation of THMs with everyday tap water use, like when washing your hands or showering, doing dishes, can significantly result in higher blood THM concentrations than simply drinking the water does. So it's not just drinking the water, it's actually inhaling the fumes from steam. Now, human health effects from low environmental doses are unclear or unknown. We just haven't had enough time to study it, but humans exposed to massive levels of THMs develop central nervous system damage and liver toxicity. Pregnant women appear to be at the greatest risk as some studies have linked the THMs to reproductive problems, including a miscarriage. Some studies have suggested a small increase in the risk of bladder and colorectal cancers. Other investigations have found that chlorination byproducts like THMs may be linked to heart, lung, kidney, liver, and central nervous system damage. Explosive perchlorates in your water can cause cancer. 
Perchlorate is both a naturally occurring and a man-made contaminant that is found in groundwater. Uh, it's found also in surface water and the soil. And most perchlorate manufactured in the U.S. is used as an oxidizer in solid fuel for rockets and missiles. Think about that for a second. It's also used in safety flares, fireworks, matches, pyrotechnics, explosives, batteries, automotive restraint, restraints because they explode when they, they deploy, and some fertilizers as well. Now, perchlorates impact human health by inhibiting the iodide uptake into the thyroid gland, and it also inhibits the production of thyroid hormone needed for prenatal growth and development, as well as for normal metabolism and mental function. Fetuses and infants have little to no reserve of thyroid hormones, so they're really most at risk. Since thyroid hormone is required for development and function of most tissues in the body, including the brain, perchlorate is considered a serious threat to human health. Studies have shown that perchlorate accumulates in some food crop leaves and also in broadleaf plants, including uh, things like lettuce, soybeans, alfalfa, tomato, uh, wheat, even cucumber and cantaloupe. It's also been found in cow's milk. Perchlorate is considered to be, they consider, the EPA says it's a likely human carcinogen. And there is clear evidence that perchlorate exposure at elevated doses does produce tumors. This one kills me because I love strawberries. But as much as you try, you just can't wash dangerous pesticides off fruit. The average American eats about eight pounds of fresh strawberries a year. And with them, dozens of pesticides, unfortunately, including some that are banned in Europe and some chemicals that have been linked to cancer and reproductive damage. If pesticide tolerance levels, think about this, were set to protect the health of children who are more vulnerable than adults, smaller body, smaller weight, smaller system, more fruits and vegetables would fail to meet EPA standards, unfortunately. That's just the world we live in. So these dangerous pesticides include, but aren't limited to, carbindazum. I can't even pronounce these. Detected on 16% of samples, it's a hormone-disrupting fungicide that damages the male reproductive system, which is cool with me, but bad for you, and that the EU has banned because of safety concerns. Bifren, bifenthrin, found on more than 29% of samples. It's an insecticide that the EPA and California regulators have designated as a possible human carcinogen. Now, the Environmental Working Group releases a list called the Dirty Dozen every year with fruits and vegetables that contain high levels of pesticides. Unfortunately, strawberries are number one again. Strawberries, grapes, and cherries are on the list. Spinach, kale, collard, and mustard greens on the list. Nectarines, peaches, apples, pears, a little further down the list. Bell and hot peppers, celery and tomatoes, all contain a high amount of pesticides. Now the Clean 15 by the EWG includes avocados, sweet corn, asparagus, onions and sweet potatoes, uh, honeydew melon, cantaloupe, watermelon, and pineapple, and also cabbage and mushrooms to a lesser degree. So those are a little safer than your other vegetables and fruits. As I continue to steal all your joy and you'll probably never eat again, I need to let you know that pepperoni and bacon probably cause cancer. Now the WHO, the World Health Organization's International Agency for the Research on Cancer and the American Institute of Cancer, they both announced the consumption of processed meat is carcinogenic to human, probably carcinogenic. So meat processing such as curing or by adding nitrates or nitrites or smoking can lead to the formation of potentially cancer causing chemicals. And we're talking about deli meats like turkey and ham found on subs and appetizer trays, pepperoni, sausage, beef jerky, bacon, and even hot dogs, staples of the American diet. The research shows that eating processed meats can increase your chances for stomach and or colorectal cancer. Now, if processed meat products are a part of your main diet, which they are for a lot of us, including me, you can take steps to reduce or eliminate them. How? Well, if it probably wouldn't hurt to slow that bus down and just eat a little bit less processed meats, right? Reduce your portion sizes of the processed meats. You don't have to cut them out entirely, but everything with a little moderation, eat them a little less frequency. And if you're doing it five times a week, maybe three times a week. Always read the label, check the ingredient list for words like nitrate, nitrite, cured, or salted. If you spot these words, it's probably a processed meat and you should probably avoid it. Even meats labeled uncured can still potentially have nitrates and nitrites in them. So you wanna to try to skip the nitrate-free meats. These meats may have less nitrates in them, but they're not nitrate-free. 
you'll have a little bit less. So when you eat these foods labeled nitrate free, your stomach turns some nitrates into nitrites through the magic of chemistry. And then some of the nitrates can cause those cancer causing substances in your body. The magic of your stomach's chemistry, right? So you could also opt to choose a plant-based diet more often or plant some meatless days or add grilled chicken or hard boiled eggs, beans, tofu, or flaked tuna to your salad instead of cubed deli meat. Or just add vegetables to your omelets instead of bacon, ham, or sausage. Or order a grilled chicken or fish sandwich instead of a deli sandwich or a hoagie or something. So maybe you've gone through everything in your house, you got rid of all the BPA plastic, because BPA-free plastics are great, right? Eh, guess what? They might still be dangerous. In 2012, the FDA banned the sale of baby bottles that contain bisphenol A, or BPA, a compound frequently found in plastics. Several studies found the chemical mimics estrogen. The resulting endocrine disruption might harm reproductive development, increase the risk of cancers, diabetes, and even obesity. So now you see this entire collection of wonderful plastics labeled BPA-free, many replaced with something called bisphenol S, or BPS. Unfortunately, BPS and other plastics contain similar chemicals that behave, a lot of them behave the same way as BPA, and they still leach into your foods and drinks. And it's not just BPA, it's BPS and other ones. There's a recent study called phthalates, a compound found in plastic, were linked to a 20% reduction in male fertility. Personally, again, I'm cool with that, but you get it, it's bad for you. Now, the FDA does not consider BPA or BPS in plastics hazardous to humans. But experts say they want more investigation on how these materials can affect human health as they leach out of plastics. Now, a manufacturer's labels pretty much suck as plastics testing company called, uh, a plastic testing company called Certichem examined 455 products and discovered that nearly all the items, including those marketed as BPA-free, leaked some sort of chemicals that mimic estrogen. So it's in all the plastics, unfortunately. So more recent studies show that nearly 81% of Americans have detectable levels of BPS in their urine. A 2013 study by the University of Texas found that even at less than one part per trillion, BPS can disrupt a cell's normal functioning, which could potentially lead to metabolic disorders such as diabetes and obesity, asthma, birth defects, or even cancer. So the problem is everything is packaged in plastic, your cheese, milk, soda bottles, and your soda cans, the lining inside soda cans, juice, yogurt, meat, bread, toothpaste, fruits, vegetables, things that are supposed to be good for you, much more packaged in plastic. So you can't totally avoid it. So how do you minimize your exposure to BPA, BPS, and all those other nasty things? Number one, avoid heat. Don't put plastic containers in the microwave or dishwasher, anywhere they're going to receive excessive heat because they may break down faster and allow the BPS to leach into your foods or drinks. Two, focus on fresh whole foods. When you can, choose fresh whole fruits and vegetables that aren't in containers that aren't pre-cut, less exposure to plastic. Three, use alternatives like glass or stainless steel containers for hot foods and liquids. No leaching in those things. Four, avoid watered bottle and plastic. Drink filtered tap water instead, which studies show contain fewer contaminants. Never leave plastic in direct sunlight or in hot places where it can degrade and start to leach things into your food or drink. Cover leftovers in silicon or foil versus plastic wrap. Replace plastic appliances like coffee makers and blenders with ones made of stainless steel or glass. And finally, never forget that smoke and exhaust fumes can kill you. Carbon monoxide kills. Working near exhaust fumes or any gas or propane burning engine, heater, generator, or even a gas barbecue can expose you to poisonous carbon monoxide gas. It's invisible. It doesn't have a smell. It's present in large amounts in vehicle exhaust fumes. Now, overexposure to this odorless and colorless gas can cause death. Even mild exposure to carbon monoxide can cause headaches, dizziness, nausea, and fatigue. You'll know it's there. You won't know where it's coming from, and you'll start to feel weird, so it gets open air quickly. Make sure the area you're using these appliances in has ample ventilation. Never use them indoors. Now, diesel exhaust, the smelly black smoke that can be seen streaming out of cruise ships, old buses, large trucks, and some construction equipment, has been called more dangerous than even standing in front of that bus. 
Soot from diesel exhaust is a known cancer-causing pollutant. Besides cancer, diesel exhaust can cause a number of health impacts, including respiratory ailments and worse asthma, headaches, runny eyes and noses, and even nausea. Look, if you can smell it, that's great. You can move away from it. Find some fresh air immediately and stay away from those exhaust fumes, regardless of where they're coming from. I hope you found some of this information helpful. Please like and share this with people you care about and subscribe to our channel for more information on how to keep yourself healthy and safe. Chuck Fresh, we'll see you all next time.